All right, everybody. How was everybody's weekend? Long. Yeah, it was. The Niners game was rough, I'll admit, especially since my, my 10 year old is just starting to get into football and he followed the Niners like really avidly all year. Um, he's like, oh, this is the perfect year for him for a 10 year old to get into to following the Niners. Uh, and then he, it did. Yes, and teaches. We had we had that big talk about about how it's just a game, and um, you know, there's always next year, and the Niners are going to be good again next year. Um, it's yeah, mirrors an experience my wife's little brother had when he was the same age. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Minnesota football history, um, but the Vikings, I don't think have ever even been to the Super Bowl. Oh, one of the early ones, like Super Bowl four or something like that, wasn't it? Or Yes, early, but sorry, since then, since my wife has been alive, they have not been to the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, But the one year they were going to go, they had a Hall of Fame kicker named Gary Anderson, and in the NFC champ, he had not, literally not missed a field goal the entire year, including preseason. And it was, they were down by one with three seconds left in the fourth quarter, and he missed his first field goal of the year. Um, and so that was almost as bad as losing in overtime like the Niners last night. So it's uh, how I met your mother actually has like a, a callback to that. The, the well, where, where were you when Gary Anderson missed the kick? They feel the same way about it that that uh, people feel about like assassinations of World Trade Center attacks. Um, that's how Minnesota sports fans feel about Gary Anderson's missing field goal. Um, so that, that was that was a uh, it was an instructional weekend. Um, somebody post asked a question about IUPAC. Um, first off, if you're seeing memes and posts about IUPAC, then you're hanging out in the right online forums. So nice work. Uh, IUPAC stands for the International Union of Practical and Applied Chemists. Um, basically, they're the ones that are the international body that decides what the standards are. They're the ones who pick the names for the elements, um, who decide what the official naming conventions are for chemicals. Um, things like that. And so it's um, basically they're they're just the group that all chemists internationally agree to listen to as the sort of like a governing body. Um, I bet you didn't realize that chemists had their own government. Um, but yeah, the IUPAC is like goes like, you know, IUPAC, federal government, state government, like IUPAC matters more um, to chemists than, than other forms of government. Um, which also feeds into how did scientists come up with the standardization for one inch to 2.5 for centimeter conversion. Um, considering the inch was defined differently worldwide, this is exactly why organizations like IUPAC exist, is so that everybody can get together and say, no, okay, this is the standard we all agree to use, so that when you're communicating from one group to another group, you're sure you're talking about the same thing. You really don't wanna have to worry about, oh, well, you're using meters, but are you using British meters or French meters? Um, and having to do with some sort of weird conversion for things like that. So um, there's also a group for standards and for physics. I can't remember what the physics group was called, but nationally we have a, a branch of the, the um, I think it's part of the Department of Commerce maybe. Um, whose job is called NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, whose job is to maintain this is our official definition of um, Eastern time. This is like they have the official atomic clock that's used to define that everything else is set according to. They have a, a platinum rod that's def the definition of a meter. Um, that's literally just a physical object. And they do the same thing for lots of other um, standard units like feet and like inches. They have a standard that they use to come back to. Um, so when they first made that that switch over to call one inch exactly 2.54 centimeters basically um nist just had to get in any countries that use inches um had to get a new definition of a foot the head that was off by you know a couple fractions of an inch um shorter than it than it was before um Somebody asked about, I've noticed a lot of you are something allied health or pre-med or something in the medical sciences. So I thought I'd answer. Um, if you're going 
to looking at pre-med type classes. If you're thinking about going into that field, it's going to be different if you're thinking nursing versus if you're thinking um, going to med school. Um, but in general, you're going to have to take two years of chemistry for pre-med. Um, usually it's the full gen chem year long series followed by at least one semester, but usually two semesters of OCHEM. Um, and then you'll also you usually take biochemistry, upper division biochem as well, but that might be in the biology department, depending on what school you're in. Um, but other than that, there's usually, I think you have to take a year of, of trig-based physics, all the standard GE stuff, um, but you can be whatever major you want and still be pre-med. Traditionally, you can still get out in four years if you're a pre-med, if you um, are a biology or biochemistry major. If you want to do something like um, being a history major and being pre-med, it might take you five years because those that's a lot of different classes that don't overlap very much. Um, but uh, that's the sort of thing that counselors can help with in at LTCC. If you want, and basically you can go check the schools you want to get into and see what they require for their pre-med track. And most four-year universities will have a, these are the classes you take to be pre-med um, that will meet the criteria for pretty much all med schools. Um, and if you aren't interested in that, if you wanna hear about the sciences you take, if you're not pre-med, ask me about it on the next quiz. Uh, I get this question a lot. So this is worth talking about. Is glass a liquid or a solid? It is definitely a solid but it's not a crystalline solid. And so this is where this miscommunication comes from, um, is, is uh, there, there is a group of material scientists that, said, that define solid as being anything that has a regular crystal pattern. And if it doesn't have a regular crystal pattern, um, meaning repetitive pattern where the atoms are in the same place um, for the entire, the entire surface of the entire um, material, um, then they call it amorphous. And amorphous does have some characteristics that are similar to a liquid. Um, but that's actually not where the where that original misconception came from. It actually came from a study that was done of stained glass windows in medieval Europe, in, in churches built in medieval Europe. Um, they noticed that the stained glass windows were, the glass was thinner at the top than the bottom. Um, and so some people took that to mean, well, that must mean it's just a really, really slow moving solid. And it's just slowly dripping down. Um, but it turns out that's not the case. It turns out that it's just because of the way that they make stained glass. If you're trying to make a stained glass window and you want to make sure that the glass panes stay upright, are you going to put the thick piece of glass at the bottom or the top? You're going to put the thicker part of the glass towards the bottom just because it's going to stand up better, right? It'll balance better. So because people misinterpreted that difference in thickness at the top versus the bottom and didn't understand the original process for making stained glass windows, that misconception about glass being a very slow moving liquid was born. Um, I talked about the Wikipedia lists of lists, right? Probably the single most um, useful list in, as far as like understanding how the world works is Wikipedia has a list of common misconceptions um, that's all sourced and it explains where some of them come from, things like that. But it's just basically a huge long list of Wikipedia articles about things like, well, some teachers say that centrifugal force doesn't exist, but some teachers say it does. Which one's right? Um, and working through that and has the history, misconception, science, et cetera. It's, again, a real fun way to lose a couple hours um, if all you have access to is uh, an inter internet browser. Um, it's, I continue to see lots of good questions about OCAM. So we'll talk about that just for a second. Why is carbon the building block for life? This will make more sense when we get into electronic structure. But basically, carbon has the ability to have lots of different stable states. Um, and, and that means you there's not really a limit to how many different molecules you could make. Um, a, lot of, a lot of compounds or a lot of elements only have very set number of stable configurations for their electrons to be in. Um, and so you are, would be pretty limited as to the number of molecules you could create with that. But carbon being acting the way it does allows you to make nearly an infinite number of molecules 
all based around the same fundamental atoms um, and structures for that matter. So there is a, there are lots of other ways that life could potentially exist though, um, but most of them are gonna be somewhat based around that, you know, flexibility is, is the current thinking in um, xenobiology, I believe is the, there's actually a scientific field dedicated to guessing what forms of life might be possible under other conditions. Um, that's known as xenobiology. Um, so if you're interested in both biology and astronomy, that's a really good field to go into. Um, just like if you're really interested in geology and astronomy, you can be an astrogeologist where you do things like study the volcanic activity on other planets. Um, so there's a lot of, that's another example of, you know, where those fields overlap. There's really cool stuff happening, really cool things to learn. Stuff that was a little more relevant. Is uncertainty only inferred in chemistry or is in other sciences as well? Um, basically all sciences use that same rule of assume plus or minus one in the last digit, unless you're specifically told otherwise. Physics is usually, um, is usually better at defining their uncertainty explicitly because they'll, they'll say it's plus or minus 0.15 um, or something like plus or minus 0.2. Um, then that's going to be based on things like calibration and figuring out, you know, just what the limits of your apparatus are. Um, but generally, if you don't see anything else, you can assume a measured number is plus or minus one in the last digit, including on things like your Apple Watch for your, you know, how far have you walked today? The reason it doesn't give you an infinite number of decimals is because the rules for uncertainty have been programmed into all those programs. Um, so it's something that winds up being pretty universal. Um, how did we find these conversions? So I kind of talked about that a little bit already too, right? Um, most of these conversions that we have or come from a definition and those, the base definitions are usually, here's what I'm calling one of something. And I'm gonna base everything else around this, this object that I'm gonna use as my definition of a meter or something else. Um, are there more conversions that the orange paper doesn't have? I hope not. I, for this class, I tried to make that list relatively conclusive. Um, if we do, it's going to be conversions we use on like a one-off basis. So usually those would be things that I would give you in the problem. Some stuff like the density of aluminum. If you need to know the density of aluminum to solve the problem, I'll usually tell you. Um, but you can also look stuff up. You're allowed to go on the internet and look up values. If you think you need the density of aluminum to solve a problem and I didn't tell you what it is, um, then you can go, you just make a note of where you got your number and write it down on your on your homework. I went to to um, the NIST web. NIST actually maintains an entire um, online database of, of physical constants for chemicals, for things like melting point, boiling point, things like that. Um, so you would just write down where you got your values and that would be, that's enough to show your work for that. Um, does anybody want to think they could explain how to know if we're dealing with exact versus measured numbers? There's a couple of different ways you can do it, but anybody want to take a stab? How do you know if it's exact or measured? How do you know if it's, me if it's exact? We'll just start with that. especially if it's a definite, this is what we call a definition. The definition of a foot is that it's 12 inches um, or the definition of an inch is that it's a one twelfth of a foot. So if it's something like that, that's a definition, that's exact. And you, the other way to think about it is if it's something where adding more decimals would give you a better number, like it's not just gonna be adding zero, zero, zero out to infinity. If adding more digits to your measurement would give you a better number, a more accurate number, then that's a measured number, right? Because there, there had to be some rounding in there somewhere. Otherwise it would just be zeros out to infinity, right? So um, anything that you put, that you can measure experimentally really is going to be a measured number. And there is a little bit of, of confusion or a crossover, I guess, between measured and exact. Because the other way you can have an exact numbers is if you're counting discrete physical objects. 
and that could mean like people. It could mean, uh, you know, how many how many fingers do I have? We can look at that and say that's a finger. That's a finger. There's five fingers, right? That's not even a great example. Like eggs is an even better example. If I say that you have twelve eggs, it's not about twelve eggs, right? It's not twelve point one eggs. It's twelve eggs. It's twelve distinct objects with no decimal places involved. Um, so counting the number of students in this room, that would be an exact number. If I said the average number of students, then that's something where you could have decimals involved, right? So average number of students is gonna have some uncertainty, but the number of students in this room right now is an exact number. There's no way that I could be off by an entire student and I can't have part of a student, right? So. It's a little bit tricky, um, but in general, most of your conversions that never change are exact, unless otherwise specified. And if it's something like, like density or speed or weight, those are gonna be measured numbers because that's gonna depend on what the actual object is. Um, one example of where exact numbers and rounded numbers or measured numbers gets tricky. Think about attendance at a baseball game, at a pro baseball game. That's technically a discrete number of people, right? In theory, you could count every single person and have an exact answer for that, 29,285. That's an exact number if you measured it in a way that it allows it to be 100% accurate. If you had to guess, because like, okay, well, we didn't measure this gate here, but we know we sold almost all of our tickets or something like that, then that's a big enough number that there might be some uncertainty. If I said that there's 29,285 people at a baseball game, that's probably actually plus or minus 10, if not 100 people, right? So that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Technically, it could be an exact number, but based on how it's measured, it probably isn't when you get that big. Yeah. When you're using like the temperature equation mm -hmm. and it has like the plus 32, is that exact? That one is exact. So they, they did the same thing with Fahrenheit and Celsius that they did with, with centimeters and inches where they said, okay, these numbers are exact. Um, and I also will point out just a reminder or a to brush up on your uh, algebra. If we're trying to solve for TC, you don't start by dividing by 1.8 unless you're going to divide the 32 by 1.8 as well. But according to your order of operations, if we're trying to solve for TC, unless we're going to divide the entire side of the equation by 1.8, we have to do the subtraction first. A few of you mix that up and subtracted 30, or they divided by 1.8 and then subtracted 32. You had to subtract the 32 first. So TF minus 32 over, and that answer over 1.8 be our temperature in Celsius, right? Um, I think for the quiz question, if you got 25 as your answer in Celsius, that's that's the mistake you made, um, is that you, you did your order of operations wrong. All right. Last question. We're going to do some more practice with mixed units um, here in a few minutes. But to answer this question, we let the units dictate what we write. We look at what's canceled out and what's not to determine what we still have to write. So keeping track of whether we're in cubic centimeters or if we're in grams is gonna be based on writing out your conversions and showing the units and showing them cancel out. Whatever doesn't cancel out is what's left over. And that's what you write as your unit for your answer. And then last but not least, I saw a few of you using these, these um, I don't know, triangles, ratio triangles. Um, I've, I was never taught to use those. Um, and really, I don't think they're that helpful in general. Um, <laughs> sorry, didn't mean to throw you in front of the bus. 
Um, I, I pref it's, it's a really good way to, to do simple algebra easily, but you lose track of the fact that what you're actually doing is algebra. And I'd rather you get better at using real, the standard algebra rules to solve for volume rather than um, using that, that triangle because th that triangle also doesn't work if you have something like with a plus 32 in it, right? That's still a conversion. That's still similar algebraic expression, um, but you get used to thinking about it this way or as a triangle rather than um, just moving the variables where you need them to following our standard algebra rules. That said, I'm not going to mark you down for using it. I'm just pointing out that I like to think about it this way. In fact, you didn't even need to do the algebra in the case of the problem from the test or from the quiz, right? A few of you took my advice and used the density like a conversion because it was, what's, does anybody have their notes? What was the number? Or it was how many grams was given, right? The mass was, is it 11? No, 12 something. And the density given was 2.21, 25. So you can do this algebraically, plug D in, plug 2.25 in here, plug 12.24 into the mass, solve for the volume. That'll give you the right answer. That's what most of you did. Um, if it's this simple of, of an equation though, I just usually think about this unit is a conversion. This means if we're talking about uh, graphite, one cubic centimeter equals 2.25 grams. So I would just personally would write this out as 12.24 grams and for every 2.25 grams is one cubic centimeter. Grams cancels grams, we're left in cubic centimeters. Mathematically, that's identical to, to taking your, what you would actually plug into your calculator would still be 12.24 divided by 2.25, right? The, the difference is you don't even need to memorize something this simple or go to your equation sheet for it. All you need to do is look at your units and make sure your units cancel each other out. Um, and that'll also tell you if you follow your units and make them cancel out properly, that'll also tell you when you made a mistake with your algebra too. Because if you mixed up your algebra and you wound up with, uh, with uh, density divided by mass instead of the other way around, then your units won't cancel out properly. You're going to get one over cubic centimeters or inverse volume, which doesn't exist. So if you watch your units, that'll actually help you catch some of those algebra errors if you're careful. All right, any other questions on the quiz before we get to some practice? All right, I guess I will also give you the plan for this week. Um, is So we're gonna do two paper assignments this week instead of doing a lab on Thursday, um, just because the timing will work out better with the material we're covering. So this week we're gonna talk in our lectures, we're gonna talk about atomic structure and atoms and protons and, and neutrons, et cetera. Um, so your first assignment for tomorrow is just going to be another conversion practice, some different with a different word problem. And if you if you like problem solving um, and word problems, if you find those kind of fun, like like I well, I do now, I probably didn't when I was when I was 17 or 18. Um, but it's got a good challenge problem on there that um, takes a little bit of work. And I think it's listed as being a bonus. So you don't have to complete that one, but we'll work through that because it's going to give us some tools, some algebra tools. Um, They're going to come become really, really helpful as we move on. Um, and then on Thursday, you'll have another another paper assignment that'll that's just going to be um, you know, writing down different isotopes, how many protons, how many neutrons, how many electrons, and doing some some basic conversions with those as well. Because once you know how to read the periodic table, every single box on the periodic table has at least three conversions built into it. Because you can say things like, okay, for every 
one atom of carbon that's it has six protons present. If you know that the atomic number on the periodic table is the count of how many protons there are, that means that allows us to write it as a conversion. And that we can do things like count how many protons are, for, are in an entire system, as long as we know what atoms make up that system. Right, so it'll be a little bit of practice with that, um, just extending the idea of conversions beyond just what's on your conversion sheet. And then next week, I'll, and I'm gonna say this again too, but just so I don't forget, um, next Wednesday, make sure you bring, bring a laptop or a Chromebook or something um, because we're gonna be working with spreadsheets and it's really, yeah, I think I can say pretty much impossible to do spreadsheets by hand. People do spreadsheets by hand before there were computers, um, but since about 1981 or so, nobody has done spreadsheets by hand because it's just way easier with the computer. So bring, bring something that can run either Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel um, to class next Wednesday and Thursday. I guess you probably could do it on your phone, but you don't want to do that. So that, that one's not a challenge. Please don't try to do it on your phone. Yes. All right, and then several of you actually wanted to walk, work through the entire, um, the entire problem three to get the final answer. So since I, and I did finally post, I forgot to post the quiz um, over the weekend. Friday was hectic. Um, I apologize for that, but the key is available for you to check your answers, but we'll work through number three as well right now. So grab your notes, if you have them, or work along with me from scratch if you just want more practice, if you feel pretty good about it. Um, we're trying to find the density of the black hole, right? So we're going to need the mass of the black hole the volume of the black hole. That's going to be what we come back to every time we're not sure what the next equation is that we're going to do. Come back here. We're trying to get everything we do should be trying to get one of these two numbers, working towards one of these two numbers. Um, so the mass of the black hole, that's one we can get from, we have the mass of the black hole is defined as um, 10 to the three suns. So we know if we can get to the mass of the sun, we can get to the mass of the black hole. And to get to the mass of the sun, we have the diameter of the sun, radius of the sun. Radius of the sun, we can get to the volume of the sun. And if we have a density, just like we did with the graphite problem. If we have the density of the sun and the volume of the sun, we can get to the mass of the sun. It's not just like the graphite example, it's backwards, right? But as long as we make the units work out, it'll be fine. So to go from radius of the sun to volume of the sun, we're just gonna do some geometry. So double check that you use the right equation for the volume of the sphere. So if we know the radius of the sun, we can plug that in and get volume of the sun. In what units is our radius in? Kilometers, right? So we might we do have to do a little bit more conversions because our density for the sun is in kilograms per meter cubed. So if we're going to if we're going to figure out our mass of the sun, we need our volume to be in cubic meters. So we can either convert our radius of the sun into meters before we cube it, or we can get our answer for volume of the sun in terms of cubic kilometers and then convert cubic kilometers. So if you just plug in the value there before you do any conversions, we plugged in seven times 10 to the three kilometers. What do we get for the volume of the sun? Say it louder. 0.5. 
kilometers cubed. What's the number though? Does that seem reasonable? So our radius is in set is seven times is seven times ten to the five. We're gonna cube that. So it's gonna be something times ten to the sixteen or seventeen times pi times four thirds. So yeah, it's about the right ballpark. All right. So then we want to get that in cubic meters to get to the mass of the sun. What conversion do we use? Yeah, one kilometer on bottom, 10 to the three meters on top. We're gonna cube that conversion though, right? So if we cube that, we're gonna wind up multiplying by 10 to the nine, right? That's a, you might not feel comfortable enough with scientific notation and powers of 10 yet, but a thousand cubed, is 10 to the nine is a trillion, which means we can just move our power here. So the volume of the sun in meters, cubic meters, 1.4 times 10 to the 27 meters cubed, right? sort of working backwards this way because this is where I left my space room. Left my room. So left myself space. Oh, that was really painful. Um, so once we have the volume, we want mass of the sun. Here's where we bring in the density, right? When we're writing out our plan here, you can also remind yourself how you're going to do that step if you want. Density of the sun is going to allow us to go from meters cubed, 1.4 times 10 to the 27 meters cubed. And for every one meter cubed, it's 1.4 times 10 to the third kilograms. So our mass of the sun, we're going to come up with 1.4 squared is probably what, 1.25? Yeah, ish. 1.3 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. 1.3 or 1.2 when you cube or when you do this. Yeah, 1.96. Oh, I was dividing by that. I was finding the square root. One, so we'll call that 2.0. Because we're only keeping two sig figs here. Right, and 10 to the 30th kilograms. That's our mass of the sun. So then mass of the black hole is 1.0 times 10 to the three times mass of the sun. Right, because that's given to us in the, in the problem statement. Mass of the black hole. So that gives us 2.0 times 10 to the 33 kilograms. What units do we want our mass in? Yeah, we, it specifies we want the density in um, in gram per cubic centimeter. So that means taking this to one more conversion, right? One kilogram, 10 to the three grams. So that gives us 2.0 times 10 to the 36 grams. <laughs> 
And just for context, for the 10 to the 36, that's a really big number, right? That's 10 to the 24 is a trillion trillion. So this is a trillion cubed is 10 to the 36. Um, yeah, it's probably the best way. And even we still can't even really process what a trillion is like, right? A billion is hard enough to process for us. Has anybody heard of that? That good way of, un of explaining just how big the difference between a billion and a million is. Um, a million seconds is about 11 days. A billion seconds is 31 years. Um, so when people talk about, it really comes up a lot in terms of economics, right? Should people be allowed to have that much money? Because it's not like it's just a little bit more than a million. It's a thousand times more than a million. And a million's already, a, well, at least for most of us, a fair bit of money. Which is why Taylor Swift didn't blink an eye at buying that, that uh, box seat at the Super Bowl, right? Did anybody know what that cost her? My wife follows all this stuff. My, my daughter's really into Taylor Swift right now. Um, that suite was $2.5 million. And she didn't blink an eye, right? Because she's a billionaire. That is not very much money. If you have, if you had a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, that would be like spending two hundred and fifty bucks. That's not that much money to someone who owns who has a billion dollars. Anyway, all that just to say, this is a really, really big number. What do we have to do to get to the volume of the black hole? We don't need a density because we're not doing anything with mass. We just have the diameter of the moon and we sit and we're told that the volume, the radius of the black hole is half the radius of the moon. So if we have the diameter, which you usually represent with a capital D to separate it from density, density is a lowercase d, diameter is a capital D. So if we have diameter of the moon, we can get to the radius of the moon, to the radius of the black hole. That math's pretty easy, right? Just have to remember to do both steps. We got to cut it in half twice, right? Because the diameter of the moon to the radius of the moon, we're just going to double it or cut it in half rather. So that gives us diameter of the moon is 2.16. times 10 to the three miles. Uh, that's when they get me, make you do a imperial conversion, right? But that means that our so the radius of the moon is going to be 1.08 times 10 to the three miles and the radius of the black hole is then 5.40 times 10 to the three miles, times 10 to the two miles. So we're almost there now, right? All we need to get the volume of the black hole we're going to use that our equation for a radius or for the um, volume of a sphere. But we might as well get it in the units we want first, right? We've got it in miles. We, we want our volume eventually to be in centimeters cubed. So we might as well take our miles and put it in centimeters before we plug it into the volume equation. This is the opposite way, the opposite approach to what we did before. Before we put it into cubic kilometers and then convert it cubic kilometers to cubic meters, we did the opposite, convert it first before we cube it now. How many sig figs are we going to want to keep in our answer? Just three, right? So that means we can actually use that miles to kilometers conversion. We don't have to go, all, although we got to go all the way to centimeters anyway. So I don't think it really saves us any time. We might as well go 
use all exact conversions. Miles to feet, feet to inches, and inches to centimeters. Check to make sure everything cancels out. Miles on top, miles on bottom, boom. Feet, feet, inches, inches, left in centimeters. So does anybody have this number done? What's the radius of the black hole in centimeters? Five hundred times five thousand. It's going to be ten to the five ish. Two point five times ten to the five or so. Now two times ten to the six times twelve. So we're ten to the seven times another two and a half. Ten to the seven. You said. Thank you. I've always. I'm not intentionally trying to manipulate the class, but I've noticed if I start doing math wrong, that's usually the fastest way to get people to speak up is when I make, if I write something down wrong, everybody wants to correct me. And I'm fine with that. If I write it down wrong, I want you to correct me. So then plug it to get the volume of the black hole. Same equation, four thirds, pi, r, Cubed. Let's see. Nine cubed is going to be like 700 or so. So something times 10 to the nine, something like seven times 10 to the nine for the cubed part, and then multiply by four. <laughs> Said times 10 to the what? 24. Once we have that, that's how we find our answer, right? You take your mass, divide it by your volume, your units you're going to be left with, grams per cubic centimeter. We should wind up with something that's in that 7 times 10 to the 11 range. Seven point oh, seven point three, and again, just to give that con that number context, that's all. That's a hundred billion grams, or a hundred million kilograms, in a milliliter of space. It's really, really dense. Turns out. Does anybody know what the densest, the densest object that exists that's not a black hole? Neutron stars. We'll talk about atomic structure today, but neutron stars are basically just a one nucleus, essentially, um, that's the size of a small planet. So if you think of an atomic nucleus, an atom's nucleus that is the size of a small planet, um, that's what a neutron star is, essentially. Which is kind of weird. So last random question before we get into, before we put away the calculators. No, we're not putting away the calculators. I take that back. Um, how do astronomers actually measure any of these numbers? Basically, if you know how far away something is, and you know how big it appears when you measure it in terms of what's the angle that your eye perceives it as. Um, you think about uh, some somebody's eye right here, looking at an object over here. Your eye is not actually measuring how big it is. Your eye actually measures your brain really processes what your eye puts in. It puts gets an angle 
which our brain is able to process that and say, okay, if I know how far away it is, if I know what, what the length is here, this distance or X value, um, and we know what the angle is, we can do some trigonometry and we can figure out how big that object must be. Because what all we're really trying to do is find this height or whatever you want it, whatever term you want to do. We're doing it in right triangles, I suppose we could call it. Um, we could use Pythagorean theorem more or less, but um, Sokotoa works better to get this received distance. So that's actually the way that we, we can measure that. That's the same thing your brain does intuitively, which is why things that are farther away, if you know that they're farther away, that your brain can then interpret the size better. You don't, if you close one eye and you lose your depth perception, you don't know if something is really close to you or if it's really far away, but really big. Or you can't tell that unless you know what this distance is. Otherwise, all your brain has to go on is what's the angle that it perceives. Yeah, once again, <laughs> turns out some of these scientists over the generations have been fairly bright and creative with how they measure things. All right. Any? Do one more math problem, just for fun. Just because somebody asked me a question about acre feet on the test, on the quiz. We're gonna do how many acre feet are in Lake Tahoe? Um, and actually one of the assignments, you're gonna do this anyway later on um, because one of your assignments uses the volume of Lake Tahoe and has you calculate some things from that. Lake Tahoe is approximately 36 cubic miles of volume, which is really, really big when you think about it. Think about making a box, a square that is six miles by six miles and then a mile deep. That's a lot of water as you might expect. We all, we all know how big Lake Tahoe is. How many cubic feet and how many acre feet are in Lake Tahoe? Getting to cubic feet we can do pretty easily, right? More, just more good practice with those higher powers of conversions. But we know our miles to to feet conversion, or at least we're working on memorizing that. We know we can look it up, nothing else. But we have to do it three times. So what do we get for an, an answer? If you don't know how to use the exponent button on your calculator, this is a good chance to practice it. If you don't know where the cube button is, just find where the caret is. That's the, the typographical symbol that means raise it to the power of. So you're typing this into your calculator, 5,200. If you don't know where the cube button is, you can still say 5,280 caret three. Interestingly enough, Again, me with weird words. Um, it's not spelled like carrot, like jewelry, or carrot, like the vegetable. It's C-A-R-E-T, and I have no clue why. Um, but carrot, like for jewelry, is K-A-R-A-T, and carrot, like the vegetable, everybody knows how to spell. And this isn't a spelling class, so I'm going to quiz you on it or anything, but this one is C-A-R-E-T. What do we get for an answer? Say it louder. 5.3 times 10 to the 12 feet cubed. Anytime you see 10 to the 12, that's a trillion, right? So 5 trillion cubic feet in 36 cubic miles. It's a pretty big number. If we want to find acre feet, part of it is you have to define what acre feet is. I would give you a better definition if I was actually asking this on a quiz or um, on a test. I would say I would remind you an acre foot is an acre of area 
a foot deep. Basically, since we have an acre to square feet conversion, we're just gonna use that. We're just not gonna cancel out all three powers of feet here. Because if we take 5.3 times 10 to the 12 feet cubed, we can say, okay, well, I'm trying to get to acres. So 43, 560 feet squared is one acre. That's gonna cancel out two of the three powers of feet and both of those. So the units that are then left is a foot times an acre. Just take it, it's just like combining variables in, in algebra, right? One X times one Y is just X Y. So acre times foot is an acre foot. We divide by 10 to the four, we get one something times 10 to the eight. Is that right? So what, that's going to be about a quarter, so about 1.3, 1.2 times 10 to the 8. So units can get weird. It's another sub you know, subtitle of this section. But when in doubt, trust your units. Treat, you know, doesn't matter if you've ever heard what it, about an acre foot before. All that matters is that you can make it so there's one acre times one foot in, at the end. I can't think of any more combined units that are combined quite like that. That one's a little bit unique. Um, but you could you could conceivably, actually, I, I take it back. The metric equivalent of an acre foot is, I believe it's kilometers squared per kilometer squared times meters. So it's an area times an, a length again. Um, although I don't think they use, I think kilometers squared, they actually use hectares maybe. There's a, there's a metric unit of area, similar to an acre, but for um, people that don't know what an acre is. All right, how are we doing? We have a little bit more time, which is perfect. Let's talk about some concepts rather than math now for a change. Unless we want to go over this one anymore. Move on to something, if not new, maybe hopefully presented in a slightly different way. Does anybody? I'll do that so we can't guess based on the, what was there. Um, does anybody know with the first time the word atom was used to describe matter? We'll take a guess what century it might have been in. It, is, it comes from the Greek, and so and it was actually an ancient Greek person, um, Democritus. Democritus was basically a philosopher around the same time as Aristotle. Um, then they were actually somewhat rivals. Um, but basically, they just came to this idea by doing a thought experiment. They didn't actually do any science. Scientific method didn't exist really in, in any sort of formal capacity until about um, 600 uh, CE. So they were just basically arguing with no way to support their arguments. They weren't doing experiments. They just were like, no, I think it should be like this. This way makes more sense to me. And just, you know, yelling at each other. Um, so... The two options they came up with is if we start taking a piece of copper wire and we start and we cut it in half and we take one of the halves and we cut that in half and we take that, we cut that in half. We just keep cutting a piece of copper in half and get smaller and smaller pieces. There's two options for what can happen. Either we get to a point where we can't divide the copper anymore, no matter how sharp the knife is, 
or we could go in infinite infinitely we could keep cutting it in half until we got to it would just continue on in, until you could have an infinitely small piece of matter um so democritus was the one who decided who argued that you get to a point where you can't cut it anymore there's a theoretical minimum size of copper that you could have and aristotle just said was of the opinion that matter could be infinitely small and it was you made all of the different types of matter by mixing together the four um, fundamental elements you know earth wind fire water um so, but they didn't have a way to test this. So they basically just had to try and convince other people of, that their approach was better. Um, and Democritus really was fighting an uphill battle here because Aristotle was already famous for his work in some mathematics areas. So he's already well known and he was already well known for being the, um, I can't remember what the order goes in. Is it Socrates then Plato or Plato then Socrates? Whichever one, he was the pupil, he was the third generation. I think, I think it goes Socrates, then Plato. So he was Plato's pupil. And everybody already knew who Plato was. So Aristotle was already, you know, medieval Greek famous, um, which is, you know, still a pretty small part of the world. Um, but the other thing that happened to Democritus is Democritus died first. And Aristotle cared about this enough and disliked Democritus enough that he actually went to Democritus' home city um, and went to the library and had all of Democritus's writings burned. Um, yeah, I, I think it was more than just they argued with each other over this. They must have known each other or Aristotle thought that, I don't know, I'm not gonna speculate on Aristotle's motives, um, but it's definitely, there's a reason why very few people had ever heard of Democritus until um, what's called the enlightenment period in medieval, uh, not medieval, in, um, post-Renaissance Europe. That's when some, some wealthy lords in Northern Europe started reading all these ancient writings and one of them came across the idea of atoms. Um, so that enough copies of Democritus's writings still existed that they were able to find them thousands of years later. Um, and at that point, they'd gotten to the point where we were able to one, understand how the scientific method worked and come up with ways we could measure and test some of these ideas. So they actually took a, just a concept and started turning it into a scientific theory. Right, so in the same time period that they were coming back up with that idea of an atom, there are basically three things that were known about chemistry. This is really the point where chemistry stopped be being alchemy, stopped being pseudoscience and just flash, flashy, colored lights and, and smoke, um, literally smoke and mirrors in a lot of cases, um, and started being science, started being chemistry, is when, is when we started looking at these three laws. First of which is law of conservation of mass. Um, and conservation of mass basically is exactly what it sounds like. Heard of that for a long time, probably first came across that term when you were, I don't know, sixth grade, when you first started being given science classes. Um, but these other ones are a little bit weird. Proust came up with law of definite proportions, which related to how many pieces, how much, uh, in terms of grams, how many grams did you need to make certain substances, grams of, of different elements. So basically, Proust realized that no matter how much hydrogen and oxygen you have, you, you needed about, two grams of hydrogen and 16 grams of oxygen to make, and they always combine in the same ratio to make 18 grams of water. So that's all he really knew. It's still just stuff we can measure. We can measure how many grams of hydrogen we had before and after, and we could measure. If we had extra of one of these, it didn't get used up. You had to combine them at the same ratio. And then Dalton realized, he built on that and realized that if you changed what these ratios were, you could make different compounds, things that had different molecular properties. So if you take two grams of hydrogen to 16 grams of oxygen, you get 18 grams of water. But if you take uh, one gram of hydrogen 
for 16 grams of oxygen. You make hydrogen, you got 17 grams of hydrogen peroxide. which they knew was fundamentally different compound than water. So Dalton's the, the scientist who gets his name on, on the big step here, because he was one who put together these three laws. And he said, the only way all three of these can be true at the same time is if we have um, atoms, if we have small individual pieces of these elements that are combining in simple whole number ratios. And so Dalton's atomic theory had four pieces to it. Every element is comprised of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from other elements. Atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. And atoms cannot change from one element to another. They can only change how they are bound to other atoms. This is, this is it. This is essentially the birthplace of modern chemistry. Is back in, this would have been around the, let's say the mid to late 1600s. There was, the term chemistry had been come up, had emerged about a hundred years earlier. Um, There's a Scottish scientist named uh, Robert Boyle who came up, who wrote a book called The Skeptical Chemist, um, but he was Scottish, and so the spelling was weird. Um, and this is old enough that it's borderline Old English, but I believe it was S-C-E-P-T-Y-C-L, C-H-Y-M-I-S-T, maybe not without the I, but that's pronounced skeptical chemist um, in an old English. Doesn't matter. That's not, I'm not going to test you on that. It's just, it's, you can still, we still have printed copies from the 1600s of this book that first coined the term chemistry. But it wasn't until Dalton, 100 years later, that we actually had something to work on, something to work with for this um, way to explain how these reactions were happening. Does anybody see any problems? Instead of, don't pretend that you're in the 1600s now, pretend that, that you're um, teenagers in 2024 and have some basic understanding of, of science. What are these, which of these are wrong in one way or another? One, why, Topher? You can split an atom. But what happens when you split an atom? Does anybody know? It releases a lot of energy. Um, it actually, when you split an atom, it actually breaks law number four, postulate number four. So you get to a point where you can't divide them anymore, but if you divide an atom, it's not that you, it's not that it's indestructible, you're right about that, but it's no longer the same element it was. If you take copper, one single copper atom and you split it, it's not copper anymore. And so that comes down to number two. How do we define what a given element is? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, any other things that might take issue with the way it's phrased or that might need to be adjusted? We could argue that simple whole number ratios is tricky. They are whole number ratios, but sometimes we get these proteins that are, you know, 100,000 atoms, um, is that a simple ratio? Well, in the mathematical sense, that's a simple ratio because it's made up whole numbers, even if they are really big whole numbers. Um, so it's simple in the mathematical sense. Um, it basically means you're only using integers. You can't have half of an atom. But yeah, that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good place to go. I like this as an example of how science works. We didn't throw out Dalton's atomic theory when we figured out that an atom could be split. Dalton's atomic theory still stands. It just needed to be adjusted. We had to change the wording on this. So maybe it doesn't say indestructible anymore. Um, we could redefine 
how we can tell what an atom is, what element it is. But we don't get rid of postulate number two. We just amend the language a little bit when we've learned more about these things. Um, and then number four, atoms in fact can change from one element to another if you break that atom apart. So actually we can do, the Manhattan Project actually was able to successfully complete the goals of alchemy originally was to change something cheap into something expensive, um, lead into gold, because they were both close to the same density. They were never able to do that. We can do that now, it just costs more money than it costs to just get the gold out of the ground. Um, but that's, and really the Manhattan Project was turning really expensive things like uranium and high explosives into um, really, really cheap things like, you know, ash, um, light. So not necessarily what the ancient alchemists envisioned, but. All right, so let's do some more science of this. Um, so at this point, this is great. We have this, we figured out we can have atoms. We started figuring out things like formula for water is H2O. And the mass of every water, every hydrogen atom and the mass of every oxygen atom are, um, can be measured in terms of, so we can actually get to water is two hydrogen atoms for every one oxygen atom. We get that ratio from Dalton's atomic theory. But at this point, the, all the elements that we were aware of were generally just listed with a bunch of properties in a table at the back of the book, it would be pages long. Um, but there wasn't really any organization to it. Typically they were either presented in the order which they were discovered chronologically, or they were presented alphabetically. Makes sense, those are the two ways that humans like to organize things, right? Um, it wasn't until Mendeleev, a Russian, a Russian scientist named Dmitry Mendeleev, um, who noticed that if you sort them based on size, by how much an atom weighs, patterns start showing up. Um, he noticed that if you sort them by size, every, whoa, that formatting's really messed up. Um, every eight elements, you got a new element with similar properties. So for instance, you start with helium, eight elements later, you get to neon. Helium and neon had very similar chemical properties. They didn't really react with anything. They were both gas at room temperature. You could measure them, but we couldn't make them do anything. They were exceptionally stable. But on the, and then one after that, lithium, and then eight elements later is sodium. Both have really similar properties in terms of how they oxidize when they come into contact with water. And so Mendeleev figuring out this pattern, he says, okay, well, I'm just gonna take all of these elements that have the same properties and I'm gonna put them in the same column in a table. I'm gonna think two dimensionally instead of just a straight list. So basically, he took the elements he was aware of and he made the first periodic table. It was called the periodic table. Does, what, does anybody know what a periodic function is? Or can you give me an example of a periodic function? If you've taken trig, you know them. So Katoa, sine, cosine. What happens when you graph sine and cosine? They repeat out to infinity, right? That's what periodic means. It repeats every set amount of time or a set amount of distance. So the periodic table is named that because after every eight elements, it repeated itself, kind of. It's not truly a periodic function because sodium is not exactly the same as lithium, but they had enough similarities that they were able to start organizing our thoughts about how things worked. Um, I think the earliest, an example, one of the earliest uh, periodic tables that may or may not have been actually typed by Mendeleev himself in the 1800s. Um, but this, if you just go look at the history of the periodic table on Wikipedia, I use Wikipedia a lot for sources, can you tell? Um, you find that this is one of the earliest ones that is presented. Although I think it's presented in, Italian, and I have no idea why Mendeleev would have typed it up in Italian. So who knows where that's, this one actually came from. Um, 
But the really interesting thing about Mendeleev's earliest tables is that they had gaps. Basically, he was able to predict that elements should exist that have these properties that nobody had ever seen before. And so those, the three that are, that are most closely tied to Mendeleev are circled in red here. Scandium, gallium, and germanium were not, were not known until Mendeleev first published his periodic table at which point people went out and started looking in mixtures of aluminum and mixtures of ores to see if we could find an element in really small concentrations that, that would be able to fill in these gaps. Uh, and, that's, and that's where, how we found those three elements. Um, germanium is really interesting from a, again, from a uh, personality point of view. The, I guess the secondary theme of this chapter is that scientists can also be petty and mean. Um, just like Aristotle and Democritus, um, Mendeleev was known for being kind of a jerk, um, and to put it mildly, um, to the point that, so Russia and Germany at this time had a very big rivalry. This is pre-World War I in the 1800s, um, but they still really didn't like each other. They were two of the global superpowers at the time. Um, and when the Russian Mendeleev's table predicted that germanium should exist, when it was discovered, it was named germanium almost, almost explicitly to piss off Mendeleev because he was Russian. They named it after his country's biggest rivals because everybody hated Mendeleev. Um, he, has, you know, he has a very tragic life story himself. He was like the youngest of 17 children. Um, and his, his father, he was born into a middle-class family pre-Bolshevik revolution. Um, his father was a literature professor at a university in Russia. Um, but right after Mendeleev was born, his father went blind. And it's not like they had the ADA and, you know, job protection in, you know, pre-revolutionary Soviet, or not Soviet, uh, Russia. So he was fired, basically, because he couldn't read anymore. If you can't read, how do you teach literature? Um, so the Mendeleev's mom got a job at a family factory that then proceeded to burn down. Um, and then so she took Mendeleev and she moved all the way across Russia to St. Petersburg so that he could go to university there at the age of like 11 or something. like. It wasn't university at that point, but basically like you had to start at 11, um, what in Russia they called gymnasiums. Um, but anyway, it left him bitter enough that everybody hated him. And it's just that picture kind of sums up. Mendeleev. Um, he's just he looks, rough. looks rough. It's kind of like a, a Leo Tolstoy novel in, in a nutshell. Um, and it wasn't in, so basically the, the guy who invented the periodic table didn't get an element named after him until more than a hundred years after he had died. Um, he was never even given a Nobel Prize or anything like that, even though he was still alive when the first Nobel Prizes were handed out. Um, because everybody disliked him. It, it took until everybody that had known him personally had died, not just until Mendeleev died. They had to wait for everybody that actually knew the guy to die. And then the IUPAC was able to convince enough people that we should name an element Mendelevium, um, which is why it's all the way down at 101, um, down there next to Nobelium. So chemists... Scientists are just people too, and sometimes they're mean, petty. All right, so we know the periodic table exists at this point. We know that atoms exist, but we don't really know much beyond that. We just think that these atoms are indestructible, that they're small, um, they can't convert from one thing to another until a guy named Thompson, um, discovered that if you put a big enough voltage across two plates, two metal plates um, in what's called a cath cathode tube, um, and the, that's basically just a vacuum. You put a plate at both ends of a vacuum, you apply enough voltage to it, you can actually get particles flying from one end of the, of the tube to another. And those particles were about 2000 times smaller than hydrogen. And we already knew that hydrogen was the smallest element at this point. So, if hydrogen is the smallest element, 
but we just found something that's smaller than hydrogen, what does that tell us? There's more elements and tells us, let me go back to this. They must not be indestructible because we can find smaller pieces of them. If we can find, if I told you that the smallest thing that exists in the universe is a car, and then you go out and you see, well, there's a pine cone that's smaller than a car, then it must not be the smallest thing in the universe now, right? So Thompson figured this out. They didn't know what they were. He called them cathode rays, but he did figure out that they had a negative charge um, they were very, very small and they were identical no matter what metals you used. What metals were on each side of this cathode too um, gave the same particles, particles with the same properties. So what did he discover? Now put on your 20, 21st century hat. Electrons specifically, not protons yet. That's actually, that comes next. Um, Basically, yeah, these cathode rays were electrons. They were negatively charged. They were tiny compared to the mass of the atoms. Um, and they were the same no matter what. So everything that exists now that's made up of these indestructible atoms, each of the atoms is made up of some amount of electrons. And just as a thought experiment, if atoms are neutral, but electrons are negative, what else must exist? A positive, something to balance that charge out, right? Otherwise you can't get neutral. All right, I'll see everybody on Wednesday. Have a good day.